بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا We are in Surah number 32 It is Surah Al-Sajdah The 21st Jews أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام تنزيل الكتاب لا ريب فيه من رب العالمين This is one of the surahs that begin with Alif Lam Mim. And as we have mentioned all the time, only Allah knows what is the meaning of these letters, known as the broken letters, Alif Lam Mim. This surah is called As-Sajda, the prostration, because of an ayah in this surah where a sajda word is mentioned. Sajda means to bow down in front of Allah and relinquish your everything for the one whom you are worshipping. So, as the surah before it is filled with knowledge, gems and pearls of wisdom, understandings of Luqman and uh, everything that a Muslim needs to know and believe in what he doesn't know as the last ayah highlighted for us. This surah is saying now you make sajda in front of Allah to show that your knowledge and your being is totally underneath uh, his will and you need him to guide you and you need him to help you understand this is why we have a sajda oh. after surah al-luqman where somebody might find that if he becomes knowledgeable he will understand luqman and then Allah says after you've understood what you can understand, then you say, I don't understand, which is the meaning of the word sajda. Sajda means, I don't understand. Sajda means, I prostrate in front of you, and I willingly submit my mind and intellect and my being and my presence in front of you. Hence, there's a relationship between Luqman and sajda where Luqman represents the universal mind and Sajda represents the uni- universal submission to Allah's will. So there's a correlation there as the Quran is one continuous dialogue and narration. Tanzeeru kitab ila rayba fihi min rabbin alameen This is a revelation of the book the sending down of the revelation or the revelation of a scripture which is what Pickthor refers here. That knowledge comes down means you have a book. The book signifies, symbolizes knowledge and then it needs to be brought down through a divine process. Right? So, Man's ascent is by using the intellect, and man's intellect helps him rise above those who don't have intellect, and those who do have intellect, meaning the angels. And then Allah says, if you do the sajda, then Allah will bring down knowledge upon you. It is what the Quran does. The Qur'an brings down knowledge, so this is a descending of knowledge. La rayba fi, in which there is no doubt. Everything that comes down from above, from Allah to the human mind, eh, there is no doubt in it. There is no speculation. It is conclusive. It will never be inconclusive. Why? Because it is mir Rabbil Alameen, from the Lord of the Worlds. 
So now if you understand the cosmos, if you understand existence, that these are the layers of existence other than God, even though they may be temporary, but they are layers of existence. So you have this layer, this layer, this layer, all the way to seven heavens, and then the Arsh, and then the Kursi. Then above that, there is Jannah, and above that, there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's now existence. And when Allah sends knowledge down, then that knowledge is pristine, it is now conclusive, there can be no doubt in it. There is no room for speculation, and there is no room to waver, and this is the knowledge Allah gave to all the prophets, and especially our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, because it, it uh, appreciates every level of existence, al-alameen. And Allah is the Lord of every level of existence. Allah knows how to foster that realm, how to develop it, how to bring it to its perfection. This is the way worship of Allah makes you more knowledgeable. Sajda is worship, right? Ibad. Sajda is Ibad. So when you're in ibadah and you relinquish your mind and your intellect, Allah will give you knowledge through the wahi of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This ayah obviously refers to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first, primarily, and as being part of his ummah. When we follow his mode and method of sajda, knowledge that came to him will come to us. Wahi will not come to us because wahi has stopped. But knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ has come to us, and we may seek that knowledge even today. And that is how Allah is the Lord of the worlds. So in this world, where, meaning this world, our world, where there is no more wahi, Allah still maintains His ability to train us, to develop us, to discipline us, and to bring us to our perfection. No? People might say there's no wahi left, so therefore, uh, we man cannot excel anymore in terms of knowledge. We say what Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ is more than enough to man, for man to develop himself. So Allah is the world, Lord of this world uh, today where there is no longer a direct wahi given to any human being. Am yaqulun aftara? Or are they going to try to invent and fabricate means and methods of knowledge and knowledge itself? No. No. You cannot invent and fabricate the truth. The truth, which is the ultimate reality, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the absolute truth. You cannot invent it, nor can you invent and fabricate a lie that is inconsistent with it. So, this is a lie explained, no doubt in it. Yeah. Do they think that they could invent and fabricate a lie against Allah? Or have an opinion or a theory that is contradictory to what Wahi is saying? So now you have Wahi based knowledge. Uh, you have knowledge that is not wahi based. So knowledge that is not wahi based sometimes may be a fabrication and sometimes may be totally inconsistent with knowledge that is wahi based. So there the Muslim will say, I make sajda. The name of the surah is sajda. So the Muslim will say, my approach to knowledge is sajda. I submit to Allah's will, to the knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu and that's the end of the discussion. There's no speculation there. بَلْ هُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكَ The truth is, this is the truth from your Lord. This is the absolute truth from your Lord. Your Lord meaning the one who trains you, fosters you, develops you, takes you from one phase to another phase. And leads you to your ultimate destination in knowledge. 
It is your ultimate destination in your physical perfection, your biological and physiological stature and your demeanor. And there's a, a, a phase, your, your destination in your moral behavior, okay, which was represented by Luqman's statements to his sons. To his son. And there is now your destination in terms of your intellectual growth and maturity, which is known as hikmah, also mentioned in Surah Luqman. And there is your spiritual perfection, which is by following the Prophet Muhammad. Right. So all of this from your Lord, the word the Rabb. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Rabb because He takes us in every phase of our life from one phase to another until we reach our perfection. And the ultimate perfection is to be with Allah in Jannah. That this tanzil is coming down, this revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is so that you may warn with this Quran and with this wahi a group of people uh, to whom no warner has come previously, meaning the Banu Ismail, the Arab of the Jazeera, the Arab of the peninsula at that time. They were never afforded a Nabi before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Whereas the Banu Israel, they were afforded many Anbiya, many Prophets, the Banu Ismail, the children of Ismail, were never given any prophet. Ismail himself was a Nabi, but he was not sent to anyone after his own family. But the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, a direct descendant of Ismail, was sent as their Nabi. So since they had no previous warner, the word warner here, to warn, also means prophethood. And then Allah gave them prophethood through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْتَدُونَ So that they may be rightly guided. So every people, uh, every community uh, have been given a warner, a nadir. That's in the Quran. In other places or you will see later on also. And here the Nabi to the last group of people who had not been given a Nabi previously is the group of people from whom the Prophet ﷺ emerged, the Banu Ismail, the Arab of the Jazeera, of the peninsula at that time. So Allah says, this is the truth. And since these people have not been exposed to wahi before, they become now the first uh, subject for receiving the last wahi. So they are not biased religiously. Whereas the Banu Israel were already biased religiously. And they were already the Ahlul Kitab, people of revelation, people of the book, people of reading and writing. Whereas the uh, Banu Israel, well, they were the Ummiyun. They didn't have a book and they did not rely on the written tradition in order for them to exist and even to govern. Sometimes they would write down documents, but very rarely. So now you had a, a community that was unbiased in terms of religious revelation versus a community that was predisposed to bias in the form of the Yahud and the Nasara, the Jews and the Christian in the Banu Israel. Right? So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa task, his task was to warn the Quraysh and the Arab of his time that this is the last revelation. And uh, when you receive the last revelation from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will go out and carry on that message because you are not biased about anyone else's revelation. So, you have an unbiased community that is going to spread the last message. That is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing the Quraysh and the Manu Ismail to be the carriers of the final word, the final revelation. So that they may be rightly guided. So the purpose of revelation 
is to be guided. The purpose of knowledge of revelation is to follow the guidance. The purpose of reading the Quran is not simply to know, because the Yahud and the Asara also know. So many times Muslims make this statement, what's the purpose of reading the Quran if you don't understand it? They say historically the Banu Israel, they knew and understood everything that was revealed to them. But we don't seek their path. Or do we? Yes? No? We should not seek their path. Right, we don't seek their path. So, if you say that knowledge and understanding of revelation is key to guidance, we will say it's instrumental. But it's not the ultimate. The ultimate is sajda. You submit to Allah. That's why this surah is called sajda. You submit to Allah. If you don't submit to Allah after knowing, then you are still misguided. Is that true? So, we see Muslims today know more about Islam than perhaps before from a global perspective. Maybe not the content, but at least a world view has emerged over the 20th century and now this century. That Muslims are more cognizant of having a world view than ever before. But they don't make sajda the way our grandparents did. Perhaps. Our grandparents made sajda. We know a bit more, we don't make sajda. We don't submit, we don't acquiesce, and we don't resign to Allah's will, but they did. Now who's guided? لَعَلَّهُمْ يَهْتَدُونَ So that they may be guided. So the purpose of revelation is not simply that you know what revelation means, and that you understand the intricacies and the nuances. The purpose of revelation is that you are guided. And the way you are guided is if you say, I make sajda. Not in the form of salat. If you do five times salat, I make sajda. No, no, no. That's not what this surah is saying. This surah is saying, as you will see at the end of the surah, when there's a contrast comparison between the Banu Israel and us, you see that the purpose of sajda in this surah means that you, you give up your intellectual understanding for what wahi is saying. Which is a bigger challenge. Right? Should we believe in this? It makes sense. Everybody in the world believes in this. Well, he says, no, don't believe in it. Can you make that sajda? This intellectual submission. If the answer is no, then you're not guided. And if the answer is yes, then you are guided. But if the answer is yes and you submit, then people will call you a loser. Where does that leave you? Guided or unguided? Guided. So that they may be rightly guided. This was the same tension with the early Sahaba. The same thing. If we say that God is one and the rest of society says no, there are many gods, then they'll see us as losers. And they did that for 13 years in Mecca. And they were persecuted for saying that. But were they guided? Sure they were guided. It is no different from the time of the Sahaba. We, we think we have it bad. <laughs> we have it good, mashallah. We still live in good homes and we still have breakfast and lunch and dinner. And we still have parties and we sell everything in the sun, mashallah. Keep us all with barakah, inshallah, and dur. But they didn't have anything. They had to sacrifice their whole existence to say that they are guided. Their whole existence. So this is why sajda now at the universal level, much, it means much more than five times salat. Much more than that. Sajda is your ability to willingly submit your intellect to what Wahi is saying. If you can do that, then you're on the highest rank of sajda. And if you can't do that, then you need to work on it. But it's a challenge. It's not easy. But if you face the challenge and Allah gives you tawfiq, Allah will reward you immensely as this surah will say, inshaAllah. Allah, who created the heavens and the earth, and 
وما بينهما في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش. In the description of the alamin mentioned in ayah number two, the worlds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now explains that world view. What is our world view about the world? So the Quran says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. There are many worlds. So which world do you want to have a world view about? The biggest challenge for modern man. Is there another world outside? Is another universe? The Quran says, the holy horses. Muslims should have a world view. The Quran says, which world are you talking about? Rabbil Alamin, Lord of the Worlds. So a Nabi's mind and imagination has already accelerated to the level where he's already there with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh, the throne of God, which is beyond this world. So never mind your science and your physics and your astronomy and all of that. He's beyond that. So we are saying, we really don't care what the world view is about this world because this world is insignificant in contrast to the other worlds. So why are you wasting time about this world? We need to feed our, our families. You do that, but that's about it. Your world view about this world is about feeding yourself and your family, right? What else is your world view? Nothing. And you can't be the, the uh, pipe pipe of all humanity without feeding yourself. You need to be fed. And who does that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he does that in every world. Every world that you are. Does he not feed the jinn? They're part of this world. He feeds the jinn. Does he not give nourishment to the angels? Do you have a world view about that? Do you know how to feed angels? But you don't believe that angels exist. They're fairies. Fairy tales. But the, for the Prophet, and, and when the Sahaba is seeing this, and hearing this in the desert, then uh, they are revived, literally. They are given life. This is amazing. This is superb knowledge, knowledge at the highest level, where there is no doubt in what the Quran is saying. So, the Quran gives us our world view about all the worlds. What is that? Allah is the one who created the heavens and the earth, all of them. Not just this universe, all of them. He is the one who created all of them. The heavens and the earth. Fi sit wa ma bainuhuma and everything within it. Fi sit that ayyam in six days. Six periods of time. As you will see later on in this surah. Right here. One and two ayat. The next ayat. Ayyam means days literally in Arabic. Yawm. It means phases, many periods of time, extended periods of time, which we don't have time to expand upon here. This is a different issue. ثم استوى على العرش, and then uh, he then mounted himself on the arsh. The arsh is above the seven heavens, and above the seven heavens you have the kursi. Above the kursi is the arsh of Allah. The arsh of the Rahman of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he, he, he governs from there Istawa here means administrator, govern, rule so he rules from above his arsh and we see this at all. now cosmological worldview. so when you read the Quran you are no longer stuck in speculative sciences as to what is the universe and how big is it? Because this becomes insignificant. As the Prophet ﷺ said, that there are seven heavens. And each heaven is contained in the heaven above it. And then the seventh heaven contains all the six heavens underneath it. And if you were to measure the seven heavens and everything within it against the kursi of Allah, then it will be like you were going to measure a ring that is thrown into an empty desert. Where the ring would be the seven heavens and the desert will be the kursi. 
this is your cosmological view. Where in science are you going to get this view? You don't get a Hubble telescope then. Right? It is only through Wahi. La Raiba Fi, there's no doubt in it. The Sahaba, when they heard this, they believed immediately and instantaneously. The Quran has taken us beyond the heavens in one revelation. And that was their pride and joy. How does it happen? The how is later. Do you believe or not? That's the first question. You can doubt only in the existence. If you believe that something exists, then you may be able to unravel how it exists. But if you don't believe in the first place, you won't ask the question. I don't believe there's seven heavens. Well, that's your prerogative, but we do. Now, how do you unravel that? Through wahi, through the Qur'an and Sunnah itself. Then you start finding other ayat of the Qur'an that speak about this, and other ahadith that speak about this in detail. And that's how you believe. But the, 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 the big question is, do you submit to this belief or not? And do you make sajda? And if you say with amazement, this is incredible and it's too incredible to believe, then that's your downfall, literally. Malikum min dunihi bin waliyyum wala shafi'ah. You have no one besides him as a friend, a patron, nor as someone who can intercede on your behalf. If you don't believe that, Allah is above everything. Not physically, but ideologically, conceptually, intellectually, and spiritually. Don't you take heed. Don't you then take heed of this ayah and say, I do believe. Once you believe, then the effects of your belief will dawn upon you. Then you don't have to disbelieve everything or anything that science says. Because science will be underneath the first heaven. Right? Everything we know as human beings, your mind can only go up to the first heaven. That is our theology. We believe that human mind is able to understand what's underneath the first heaven. And we have proof of that through other ayat and through the Sunnah of the Prophet and statements of the Sahaba and other scholars who say this. So we, we, we submit that yes, in this world where there is a physical realm, the realm of bodies, there is cause and effect and we may be able to understand how that cause and effect works. We can understand the laws and principles that guide this world through the mechanical universe or the laws of science. And sometimes they may change if Allah wants them to change. But this is how we do our business in this world. Above this heaven, there's another heaven. That heaven has its own rules also. Until you get all the way to the Kursi. And then the Arsh. And beyond the Arsh, there is Jannah. And then Jannah has its own rules of existence. And so on. Right? So this is how, this is how the Muslim uh, mind works. The Muslim mind will not reject what happens at any stage. So you have the birth of the fetus, the growth of the fetus and the embryo. Okay. So the way the human being grows in the uterus, in the womb, is very different from how it grows outside of the womb. But you can't draw an analogy and say, look, outside of the womb the human being grows this way. So therefore, because he grows this way, I will reject any idea or theory of how he grows in the uterus. That's nonsense. No? Did you grow to be six foot tall in the uterus? I hope not. Your mother will be in trouble. Well, since the, 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 the human being doesn't grow this way in the uterus, therefore, whatever we know from the Quran about how the fetus develops is also wrong. Now you're, you're making a false comparison. It's an absurd analogy. Right? It's called Qiyas in, Malfar in, in our language. In an absurd analogy. So you can't do that. You can't cross reference the zones and realms of existence in Alam. This Alam is different, this world is different, and that world is different. Likewise, when the Prophet says this happens in the grave, then you can't cross reference what happens here, there. That's an absurd analogy. What happens there, you don't know. Because you have no access to that realm. 
Only prophets have access to that realm. And he gave us what he gave us. Therefore, we, we cannot use any uh, law in any realm, any world, to try to understand what happens in another world. And that is why he Don't you then take heed. Meaning there's no doubt in what the Prophet said. And what he says to us in the Quran or in the, sun, in the, in the Sunnah, uh, that is how we make such that to this. So we will deny only this uh, absurd analogy. If the analogy is correct, meaning it's in, within the, the realm of that person's reference and existence, it's fine. In this world, this is what happens. If water boils at 100 degrees, it's fine. We don't have a problem believing that it's real. And that's how we see the Sahaba understanding that we, you may understand how this world works. At this moment, I'm not too bothered about how this world works. I'm concerned about how that world works. And you don't have knowledge of that, but the Nabi does. Therefore, I will ask the Nabi, I won't ask you. Right? So using a scientific formula to understand how the world of the graves work and how the day of judge, but judgment works and how Jannah works, that is a wrong tool. It's too small. You won't be able to gauge anything there because you don't have that uh, faculty through which and with which you will be able to understand. يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمَرَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ يَعْرُجُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانِ مِخْدَارُهُ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَوَدُّونَ that he governs and then manages the command. Allah. Yudabbir means to govern and to manage. Right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sends down an amr from the heavens onto the earth. And then he, re- he, he re-governs and then he reprocesses everything. That the amr comes and then he directs and manages the amr from the heavens to the earth. Then it goes back to him. How does it go back to him? He said, now we, we are going to use another point of reference. We are going to use another index. Then it travels to him upwards. In one day, whose amount is like a thousand years that you count. From your point of view, from your reference, it will take a thousand years for Allah's command to go from the earth back to the heavens. Now you go to the... No. In one day. This day, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a thousand years. As mentioned in Surah Hajj, we did that there. This one, this ayah says that the way Allah governs is that the command comes from the heavens to the earth and by the time it goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it takes a thousand years and now the time becomes relative. Time because what? Relative. A thousand years that you count even the years on earth or any other index that you may want to use as human beings. Now you don't understand this. Do you understand this? Does anyone understand this? No. Is it something you want to talk about from the member? You should do. Just show everybody that you're not as smart as you think you are. Tanzil kitabi la raiba fi. There's no doubt in it. This is revelation. This is wahiba. You have to believe. If you don't believe in this, you're not the Muslim. Period. Right? Then you can't fabricate lies against Allah and the Quran. So maybe you should say something. And say, look, not everything in this world we understand, nor are we supposed to understand. That is the point of your existence, that you leave things to Allah, where you're supposed to leave them to Allah. You can't go try and manipulate in everything that you see, hear, feel, and smell, and sense. Your five senses are very limited. Your tools of acquiring knowledge are your five senses, and your mind. And your mind is also limited. And your intellect and your ruh is also limited. Now you go and figure that now. Allah gives a command that this person has to die today. That command goes back to Allah in a thousand years. So what's it doing for a thousand years? 
when someone dies, what's the aqidah? Does he die through Allah's command or not? He does. So when a command comes that this person has to live or die, or do this and that, that is one amr. This amr, according to this ayah, set, means uh, this amr takes a thousand years to go back to Allah. So what's he doing managing, directing the amr in a thousand years? Well, you know, I have no idea. Any more than you do. Right? But what do we do? We make sajda. We submit. This is what the Quran is saying. We believe. La fi. There's no doubt. Do we understand it? No. Not in a thousand years. Not in a thousand years. Are we going to wait for that? No. By that time we'll die. Then the matter is resolved. It's too late for us to ask that question. But this is what happens. Now, when you use this reality, this aqidah in this ayah, that one amr goes back in a thousand years, then how many uh, thousands of awamir, amr, commands, has Allah set down since Adam? Trillions. And how much time did they take to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You do the command. Which you can't do. So only Allah knows how he works. Only Allah knows what he does and how he does it. And that's the point. That we don't know how Allah works. And that's why we worship him. And no one else. In your small little microscopic world and your life. MashaAllah give us all. InshaAllah. Afiyah and comfort. 70, 70 years, 80 years, whatever. Allah give us long lives. And then we, we can say, okay, we don't understand a thing about our lives. Do we? No. Can we? No. What can we do? We can worship Allah. We can plan. And we can forecast. But then Allah has his own plans. And he does things the way he does. If Allah does what he wants. And that's why we worship him. Because he does what he wants and we can't do what we want. Even though we plan. Even planning is part of Sharia and you're supposed to plan and forecast and make sure you avoid situations of uh, danger and harm and uh, uh, try to procure advantages and benefits. But you don't know what you are going to do tomorrow as the last ayah of Surah Luqman said. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he directs every command and it takes a thousand years to go back to him through the channels of the angels and then the angels record that, re-record that. They record it uh, before it comes down and they re-record it when it's there. When it's in the first heaven. A thousand years. Now you go figure, what kind of networking is that? How many angels... Uh, we'll be doing that. Thousands and thousands of them. Millions. Only Allah knows uh, the, uh, the, the armies of uh, his kingdom. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُ That no one knows the armies of your Lord except he. Only Allah knows how he does what he does. So now in the question of six days versus a thousand years. So the first ayat tells us six days. And the second ayah tells us a day that is as long as a thousand. But the thousand years is for the Amr to travel to the first heaven. And then from the first heaven to the second, the Quran doesn't say how long it takes. Then from the second to the third, and then all the way to the seventh, then from the seventh to the Kursi, and then the Kursi of the Arsh, you don't know. It's beyond us. It's beyond computation. You can't, you can't even uh, imagine how many uh, variables there are there. Right. Are we supposed to know this? Yes. We're supposed to believe in it. That's why we're supposed to know it. Do you understand this? No. Why? Because you make sajda. You don't understand Allah. That's why you worship Him. How will He give you what you want from Him? By you obeying the laws of every world. So we're obligated to obey the laws of this world Meaning, follow the Quran, Sunnah, and Sharia as much as we can, and then rely on Allah's fadl. That's 
Zalik. And that is, he is the knower of the ghayb, the one who knows the ghayb and the shahada, the inner and the outer, the hidden and the exposed, that which you cannot witness, the ghayb, and that which you do witness, the shahada. So there are many umur, awamir, affairs, commands, that you will never be able to witness because you're not capable as a human being and there are several that you may be able to observe the invisible and the visible. Yeah. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and since his knowledge is eternal, comprehensive, macroscopic, microscopic, he is an aziz, the overwhelming, the mighty, the supreme, an aziz. And at the same time, if you fear that he is going to overwhelm you, he is also a rahim he is the merciful. So now you have every component of divinity that a man can conceive of, might, power, knowledge. This is what you need in someone who is going to be the director or the manager, the mudabbir, someone who is going to govern and direct and manage everything that he is in control over or has been put in control over, then you need these abilities and these characteristics also. That you need the macroscopic and the microscopic knowledge and you also need the ability, the power, the might, and you also need to show that you are aware of human frailties and human deficiencies. ar so that you know how to do things the way you're supposed to do things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now from the beginning of the surah until here, is saying that your, your knowledge becomes supreme once you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't lose any knowledge, you gain knowledge, which is antithetical to what Muslims have been promoting the past century. Where because we submit too much to God, we don't know anything. So here the Quran is saying, if you submit to Allah, you'll know much more than what you do now. The point is, you only want to know what's in this world. And Wahi came to tell you of what's beyond this world. So whose knowledge is more comprehensive? A person who believes in Wahi or a person who rejects Wahi? I mean, you don't know that it takes a thousand years for this thing to kind of uh, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A thousand years. Did you know that? No. But you're worried about planning and forecasting your life, which is 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. Maximum. Can you plan for 100 years? Governments do, and they should. Right? Governments should plan for 100 years, or 200 years, or 300 years. Okay. Now, there's just so many variables in, in the world today through science and technology. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All right, just look at Trump. He changes his mind every day. You can't plan for that. How are you going to plan for that? No? Last year, we never heard of the guy. Now, this year, everybody knows the guy. And next year, we don't know who, who's going to be there, what's going to happen. Only Allah knows. How do you plan for all this? With all the invariables. So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is supreme. For the Muslim, it is that you must be able to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to behave so that you have the ability to plan and forecast at least a thousand months ahead. Where does that come from? From Laylatul Qadr. Right? If you have Laylatul Qadr, you'll be able to plan for a thousand months. Alf Shah. Anyway, this is how we find the, the prophets and the Anbiya planning not only for life in this world, but for life after this world. So they are the visionaries. Who? Those who plan for life after death. And those who plan only for this life, they're not visionaries, they're myopic. They only have one side of the eye of the brain. They don't have the other side, which is rooted in wahi. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ came to remind people that they will die. And when they die, this is going to happen. So they are the true visionaries of mankind. The visions in mankind, they plan for 100 years. 
maybe 200 years, not more than that. This was apparent in the Sahaba when they ruled, as we have examples after examples as to how the Sahaba did their fiqh, and how they governed and how they made decisions, not just for their time, but for time to come, as is very apparent, especially in the dealings of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. That's something we do when we study the seerah of the Sahaba and so on. الذي أحسن كل شيء خلقه وبدأ خلق الإنسان من طين. It's a very important discussion in the uh, excuse the expression light of today's knowledge or ignorance, the beginnings and the origins of the human being. How did we begin? What are our origins? So the Quran mentions this also through Wahi. The short form, the long form we'll do next week, inshallah. Now the short form is this ayah. That the one, he knows the ghayb, that which you are not privy to. And he knows the shahada, that which you are privy to. And because of that, he is now expressing his knowledge about the origins of human creation. The one who perfected everything is creation. Ahsana kulla shayn khalaqahu. And then, okay, everything includes man. So what about man? وَبَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ طِينٍ And he initiated the process of creating man from clay. طِينٍ right. In Adam, as I mentioned in the last ayah of Surah Al-Khman, his uh, process of creation began with collecting the soil from every part of the earth and then that was kneaded with water. And then that water and the clay became mud. The water and the soil became mud and then eventually clay. Right. So this is our khidah. About what? The origins of man. Now you have to believe in this. The science says something else. There was science there when Allah did this? Now this is before time, right? You talk about before time. Allah did this before time that you can relate to. Allah initiated Bada'a. Bada'a means to start, to begin. Ibtida. Someone, when, when someone starts something, Ibtida. This is the beginning. So the beginning of human creation is from clay. That's your aqidah. And whose knowledge is this? The knowledge of the one who knows the ghayb and the shahada. You have knowledge of a little part of the shahada. But you don't have knowledge of the ghayb. You were not there when Adam was initially created. So why even debating the whole issue? Well, we have proof. No, no, you don't. You have speculative ideas, uh, which you say are theories, and those theories will change in the next five years, and then the next five years, and then the next five years. Every theory changes. So here we see that the, the Quran is given us an aqidah. The aqidah is now what we call conclusive knowledge. What is aqidah? Aqidah is conclusive knowledge, is ilm. Yes. And that's how every aqidah must be conclusive. If conclusive meaning it came from wahi, and this is what we are required to believe. You say, what about everything else? In the that's for them, not for us. ثُمَّ جَعَلَ نَسْلَهُ مِن سُلَالَةٍ مِن مَاءٍ مَهِينٍ And then he continued the creation of man through a seed, sulala, that was then made of fluid, despised fluid, the semen. So now, Adam was created from teen, and then his offspring was created from his seed, which is in the semen, the sperm. And that's all you need to know about the origins of man. Everything in between is not necessary for you to discuss. That's how Allah created Adam and the human being, insan. Says insan as the total uh, of a comprehensive creation in Adam. And finally in the short form, ثُمَّ And then he perfected and fashioned man and shaped him the way he wanted to and then blew in him his ruh his life, وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفِدَةِ 
and then made for him in the womb his uh, hearing and his seeing and his uh, ability to think and contemplate his fuad, his heart and brain and everything. Very little is that what you give thanks for. So here, shukr, as mentioned in Surah Luqman, is a great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here the Quran is saying that you should make shukr for the knowledge Allah is giving you. Not only for the fact that He's given you, you're seeing and you're hearing and you believe and you're thinking, but also for the knowledge He's given you that you don't have to roam around in darkness for a thousand years trying to figure out uh, where the heck did we come from? Speculation is not something that you want to wish for, neither for you nor for your children. Aqeedah is primary and is paramount. So the Aqeedah is greater than your case. Now, people say, well, this evolution theory and this and this and this. You deal with it. I don't have a problem with this. You have a problem with it, you deal with it. Well, don't make your problem my problem. I don't have to convince you because I already believe. Nor do I really care. You can go and spend millions and billions of dollars doing the research. The American people should care that you're wasting money. Right? Whether it's creationism or Darwinism or evolution. Or I mean, that for us, it says that look, this pertains to how we came into being. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us into being through Adam and Hawa, and then in this world, this is how we come down. So there's no procreation in Jannah. Right? So how did we procreate here? <coughs> through marriage. They were already married in Jannah, so they came here, they were through marriage, and had marriage, and this is the way. What's the law of procreation here in this world? And, uh, does everybody now say that before... You want to appreciate that human beings came from a sperm and an egg. That they have to know the Darwinian theory of existence. Where did they come from? Where did the sperm come from? Where did the egg come from? I mean, it's totally unnecessary. Okay? As we will expand, inshallah, next week. This is just a short form. The long form next week, inshallah. We'll discuss much more in detail than that. Hopefully you are okay with the Akhidah also. جزاكم الله خير سبحان الله الحمد لله سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وصلى الله عليه وسلم